So this uh, paper grew out of uh, an, a realization that uh, most global issues are uh, also uh, and very often uh, transgenerational issues. So that uh, when you think of issues of global warming and other sorts of issues that are clearly issues of global justice, they also have uh, uh, strong uh, temporal and transgenerational uh, components. And this paper is about the distinctive obligations of transnational justice that come from uh, democratic institutions. So most citizens in existing democracies assume that their polity will remain democratic, if not for centuries, at least for the foreseeable future. Framers of constitutions also expect that the constitutions they formulated will be inherited by future generations, even as they often make it possible for them to respond to the imperfections in them through the amendment process. Except in these moments of revision, uh, the workings of democracy are often thought of in remarkably atemporal ways. The people now assembled are supposed to decide authoritatively and finally for the future of democracy. So conceived, the democratic political community is doubly bounded, spatially by the borders of the demos and temporally by those who can be assembled in the present. Such a narrow temporal interpretation of democracy implies that democracies are a succession of independent generations so that with enough distance between the past and future generations, um, they are often thought, the future generations are often thought of as outside of the political community. And he, Rawls even says so uh, explicitly uh, in his account of uh, the just savings rate. But those who endorse such an interpretation, I think, will fail to heed Seneca's cosmopolitan injunction that a just polity ought never to be a dominator including an intergenerational dominator. For democracies then, cosmopolitanism begins at home in achieving non-domination across generations. It might be thought that intergenerational democracy falls directly outside, out of the concept of self-rule. However, an adequate treatment of the problems of intergenerational domination demands a transformation of many current understandings of democratic concepts, such as popular sovereignty. These difficulties are structural in two respects. First, democracy, and especially majoritarian democracy, is inherently biased towards the present. Given this bias, the greater the temporal distance between present and future generations, the less likely it is that the interests of the latter will be taken into account. Furthermore, simply because of the arrow of time, enormous asymmetries of power exist between present generations on the one hand and past and future generations on the other. Along with distinctly institutional failures, this temporal bias of democracy often results in the tyranny of the present, a problem that is only exacerbated by the preeminence of, of aggregative decision-making processes. This bias is thus not merely a, a version of the tyranny of the majority, which disadvantages a segment of the present political community, but also affects all those who will live in the future political community. If they are dominated, then the overall prospects for fulfilling the democratic ideal are greatly diminished. Cosmopolitans have long pointed out that non-domination requires pooling sovereignty across borders. The same argument, I think, may be applied across generations. Any argument for an intergenerational conception of democracy must consider at least four main issues, each comprising a step in my overall argument. First, non-domination uh, seems uh, limited, even in existing democracies, to those who are citizens. The freedom from domination is thus limited to those who have the status of being a citizen. And when this status is defined in temporally and spatially restrictive ways, citizens may come to dominate non-citizens both, both outside their borders and their generations. Second, in light of the possibility that democracies can dominate future generations as they do citizens, some version of Burke's view that the political communi community is a partnership across generation between those who are living, uh, as he says, those who are dead and those who are not yet born, 
should be expected and extended across many democratic concepts. For example, popular sovereignty can be made intergenerational if each generation regards itself, as he puts it, a temporary possessor of democratic power and thus not its final and entire master. So against various objections that such a partnership is conceptually or metaphysically impossible, uh, I'll uh, uh, argue uh, that it is actually necessary uh, for democracy itself. Um, third, when, this, uh, when uh, future generations are dominated, I want to argue so too are living citizens. They are insecure in their non-domination and this lack of security extends most importantly for our purposes to rights and entitlements to, natural, to the natural environment that can only be attained uh, 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 in practices of intergenerational management. The fact that uh, democracies and democratic practices are not intergenerational I think leads to environmental insecurity, a perf pervasive form of insecurity uh, in uh, the present. The insecurity of democratic non-domination can be avoided then only if each generation has both forward and backward looking rights and obligations to all others. As, sh as a shared form of freedom, environmental security is uh, 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 found when there is no spatial or temporal demos that can assert some final authority over the past, the present, or the future. And finally, I will consider uh, a more minimal claim that uh, such security is an instrumental uh, benefit uh, of democracy. So democracy is said to have many different benefits, uh, both instrumental and constitutive. The constitutive benefits are tied to the status of citizenship as a way to realize freedom and equality. Preeminent among the instrumental benefits of democracy related to citizenship are, as I've just mentioned, basic forms of security, which among other things result from possessing the capability to avoid the great ills of domination. Indeed, two of the most well-known social scientific generalizations about democracy concern the absence of two such evils, war and famine. And the relative absence of these two great causes of human suffering can be tied or is often tied to the operation of distinctive features of democracy. But without some fine-grained explanation of the mechanisms that produce these benefits, there is no reason to believe that these generalizations will hold or in the future or have always held. When considering famines, Sen, Amartya Sen argues that behind these positive generalizations is what he calls the protective reach of democracy. And thus, the kind of security that is directly tied uh, to democratic institutions. The rule of law might be considered an alternative explanation, but Sen argues that starvation deaths can reflect legality with a vengeance. Famine prevention then could be attained by fairly simple democratic mechanisms of accountability, such as, a com as competitive elections and a free press. Environmental security or the security of entitlement and, and rights related to the contributions of natural resources to human well-being might then also be a uh, matter for the protective reach uh, of democratic institutions. Sen clearly goes farther and sees democracy as having more uh, than a protective reach insofar as it provides the institutional means to empower citizens to act and thus enable them to defend their entitlements. This protective feature then is more like self-help uh, and thus more active and dynamic than merely having some uh, external uh, protector insofar as democracies offer genuine opportunities uh, for uh, the exercise uh, of substantial freedom. This kind of enabling condition, I think, then is an essential to the explanation of the role of phenomena produced by democracy that serve as sends exponents, citizens, powers, and entitlements. If these are curtailed, as they have been, for example, in the United States in response to terrorism, then citizens have less capacity to avoid the evils of war and thus less security overall, especially with regard to their freedoms. 
Another of the great success stories of the protective reach of democracy in the last decades is the capacity of democratic states to begin to accommodate many forms of cultural pluralism. The primary mechanism has been political inclusion in which uh, rights and powers of citizenship have been expanded uh, to include an ever more diverse citizenry. Democratic practices in many uh, existing democracies have become thus less exclusionary with the wider conceptions of public reason and a broader background political culture in which citizen sta citizenship status and capabilities are extended to many previously disenfranchised groups. At the same time, the success, I think, has reached new limits with ever increasing numbers of illegal persons, including undocumented immigrants, coerced day laborers, and many pr people who live under illegal circumstances, such as squatters in many urban areas uh, around the world. Such persons, I think, lack the most basic legal status, the right to rights in Arendt's terms, uh, and thus are effectively not subjects uh, within um, the constitutional rule of law. Future citizens may also, I think, lack uh, even uh, this uh, most basic status. Even among those with citizenship status, temporal location now has new salience as environmental problems, particularly global warming, present forms of in insecurity that affect democracies and non-democracies alike. Modern democracies depend on economic growth that threatens environmental integrity, thus leaving no zone of uh, democratic protection uh, for the environment that is analogous to the zone of democratic peace. The capacity of democracies to dominate future generations is thus very different from the domination of people without free status. It has a distinctive temporal dimension of dependence that affects future generations both inside and outside the polity. The typical democratic solution to the problem of domination, political inclusion, does not easily extend the protections of democracy temporally, since democracies are now clearly among those who harm both past and future generations. The partnership between generations can be broken democratically. Regarded from the point of view of some future generation, we are the past that dominates their present, making it impossible for them to enjoy the freedom of domin from domination uh, that uh, uh, seems to be the promise uh, of egalitarian relationships. Because of intergenerational democ uh, domination, democracies are now insecure in many different ways. Since uh, they currently lack the capacity to preserve environmental goods by democratic means, leaving future generations vulnerable uh, to just this kind of domination by our generation, whose degradation of the environment violates the stricture that it must regard itself as only the temporary possessor uh, of democratic power. Nonetheless, I think there is uh, still hope um, uh, that this new form of security will admit to some kind of solution similar to that which Sen argues for in the case of famine. Not the simple presence of democracy, but rather improved intergenerational democratic practice. Or to put it as Jane Addams does, the only cure for uh, the ills of democracy uh, is more democracy. Uh, and in this case, as Dewey notes, uh, it will have to be a democracy that is genuinely different uh, in kind. But how can democracy institutionalize intergenerational non-domination? a partnership among past, present, and future generations in which no generation takes itself to be the master uh, of others. The present generation does implicitly, whether explicitly or implicitly, take itself to have final authority uh, over the environment. Um, and that makes uh, future generations uh, insecure uh, from uh, being dominated by them. But can the past, present, and future generations be brought into partnership um, in democratic decision making? So the next objection is something like this, that uh, the idea of uh, intergenerational democracy is metaphysically impossible or conceptually incoherent uh, because um, uh, uh, the 
people in the past are dead and thus uh, uh, have uh, no status or interest, and people in the future are only potential uh, people, and thus uh, can make, uh, for that reason, uh, no claim uh, uh, upon uh, the present. Um, so I think uh, the, the two objections then are, are uh, that the democratic community thus uh, um, can exist only in the present uh, among uh, citizens uh, now. Um, the uh, past and the future are not part of the electorate, electorate and nor can they participate uh, in decisions made at a time uh, when they are either dead or do not exist. The second objection uh, is that possible reciprocity between generations uh, becomes uh, more and more remote uh, with uh, time, so it is difficult to imagine that uh, any, even a democratic people will sacrifice itself in the present for benefits that will be experienced uh, in uh, a fairly distant future. So in that way, uh, many argue it is uh, rational uh, to discount uh, uh, the well-being of the future um, and to address uh, more pressing concerns that need to be uh, uh, taken up uh, among the needs of the current generation. So as, as Al Gore puts it, the past whispers while the present uh, shouts. I think this argument is the temporal, a temporal equivalent to a common objection to cosmopolitanism, that our obligations are always to those uh, near uh, and dear. Um, both of these are both of the both the metaphysical argument and this uh, moral limitation argument. I think miss uh, the issue of uh, the asymmetries of power uh, that make it possible for us uh, to dominate both past and future generations. They ignore other temporal facts as well that all generations are vulnerable uh, to domination, since every generation is or has been a future to some past um, and a past uh, or will be a past uh, to some future. Similar practical arguments uh, reject uh, giving the natural environment a prominent place uh, in democratic um, deliberation. This bias is pervasive in economics, particularly when it is concerned with issues related uh, to well-being. The problem is not simply that we measures of wealth focus on production uh, and uh, consumption. Uh, so many of them, uh, uh, like the UN Development Index, focus on current well-being. But such, uh, however much such indices are improvements on the previous measures, their emphasis on the present and present economic development leaves out important contributions that the natural environment uh, gives to human well-being. The environment contributes most directly to long-term processes of change and development so that the, its degradation directly affects the security of democratic institutions and of individual well-being. There is a high correlation between pov poverty and environmental degradation, particularly in areas where people depend on the natural prov provision of many valuable goods, such as fertile soil, drinkable water, uh, and other basic necessities, which Partha Dasgupta aptly calls ecological services. Indeed, large migrations from the countryside to urban areas often occur when local common property resources degrade to the point where life at home uh, is impossible. Forest and watersheds degrade, and the environment loses biodiversity and resilience, so that the poorest in a society often suffer the most from the lack of such environmental services. Because of these blind spots in our understanding of, of the role of nature in human well-being and in our tendency to discount the future uh, 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 and the future's well-being, democracy is not necessarily always a means to promote ec ecological security in the same way that it has been a means uh, uh, when it is true to itself uh, to provide security from war and other forms of political violence. The treatment of the environment by the current gem generations uh, will thus greatly affect uh, the worst off uh, in future generations. How might we solve this more general problem of intergenerational domination? 
One possibility is a partnership among generations to be created constitutionally, as when the Constitution bi binds each gener generation to respect the well-being of the future. Just as Ulysses allowed himself to be bound by the mast, democracy might seek to require each generation not to dominate the future by temporally limiting its effective political power. Such worries have led uh, many to adopt uh, the view that constitutions thus act as pre-commitments, or in Stephen Holmes's term, the Constitution is Peter sober while the electorate is Peter drunk. The pre-commitment, however, is not a state, this kind of pre-commitment is not a stable device of self-limitation, since subsequent generations may, like Thomas Jefferson, reject these commitments as the domination of the past. As much as self-limitations, uh, Pre-commitments create an intergenerational game of competing interests in which asymmetries in the interest between the past and the future and the present um, assure that there is no credible mechanism uh, for compliance. The present wins because it can, since the future benefits may be discounted relative uh, to present costs. Pre-commitments then do little to change the condition that creates conflicts among genera genera generations by trying to remove these conflicts from the purview of democratic decision making. If such conflicts can be taken to be part of democracy, then the structural uh, differences uh, and difficulties must be addressed head on. Popular sovereignty must be practically realized in a different way as pooled or shared across generations in order to uh, that manifest injustice uh, be avoided. One way to solve intergenerational conflict would be by radical surgery. Given uh, uncertainties in determining the future, we cannot regard our future selves as continuous with our, our current selves. Uh, this is Derek Parfit's view uh, in the sense that he thinks we regard our future selves in the same way that we regard uh, other distinct uh, individuals. Similarly, many argue that the more distance and distant the past and the future are, even in the same community, the more they should be uh, treated as if they do not share uh, in this community. But this would have radical consequences. Um, Rawls argues uh, uh, in his uh, discussion of the future uh, that we save for the future uh, in the same way uh, that we make contributions uh, to foreign aid. It is impossible, he says, to tell if future generations will accept our principle of justice, so they have to count uh, as uh, outsiders. Rawls also thought for this reason that any obligations that come from sharing the political community should also extend only to the near future, much in the way that our obligations of justice in general give priority to those nearest to us spatially. In order to avoid the potential for domination implicit in these views, it is better um, uh, to treat uh, distant members as uh, members of and potential members of the same political community who are able uh, through surrogates or spokespersons to make claims of justice across space and time, particularly the injustices that the present generation is perpetrating by acting as the final uh, master of the democratic process. Indeed, we might think of certain practical devices, such as forms of representation of the past and future interests that would provide an acknowledgement of the claims of future generations. Thus, if democracies are to avoid intergenerational uh, democracy, pooling sovereignty requires sharing statuses and freedom across time, which is something that Rawls's view of the future fails to avoid. So it'd be in instructive, I think, first to turn to the significance of the past uh, in intergenerational conflict, perhaps because uh, uh, interaction between past and future generation, generations are unavoidably mediated. In fact, the past often has made political claims uh, upon the present um, uh, through intermediaries, usually related to past injustices uh, and past harms. Such claims are intergenerational in the sense that they are as much about the future as they are about the past. Intergenerational requirement, uh, democracy requires then that the past is not closed 
at least in the sense that it may acquire, this generation may acquire new obligations towards it in the course of political life. As when we consider the claims of dominated peoples such as the aboriginals uh, in uh, North America and elsewhere with a history of injustice. When the rights of these people are recognized on their own terms as the Supreme Court in Canada did with respect to certain aboriginal land claims, the court saw itself as challenged and addressed by historical claims that transcended the previous normative framework of the Canadian Constitution. In doing so, Canada became a community of peoples, a transnational polity of pooled sovereignties. And this means that in dealing with claims of the past generation, um, the polity in the present uh, can change. So now it's time to turn to the future uh, and uh, provide a more uh, full intergenerational uh, alternative. While majoritarian democracy is biased to the present, a similar criticism can also be made about deliberative democracy that is thought of as a face-to-face -face mutual and simultaneous process. The assumption of the closed past uh, also would have a democratic counterpart. The deliberating people decide now and decide as the sovereign with democratic authority. This might be justified by a particular conception of self-rule in which the people are the authors and the subjects of the laws. This interpretation might also be thought to be sufficient for non-domination. That's why they're both authors uh, and subjects. However, while the people in a narrow and restricted temporal sense are both the authors and the subjects of the laws, those who are subject to the laws extend temporally into the future, and in some cases back to the past. However, admirable, ad admirably political equality is expressed in this idea of a self-legislating people an atemporal understanding of the subjects of laws is not sufficient for non-domination. Or as Dennis Thompson puts it with regard uh, to uh, the majoritarian view of sovereignty, even if no other values except sovereignty were at stake, this principle cannot give any particular major majority uh, final authority to dominate. Since the claims of future sovereigns are undervalued by current democracies or thought to be necessarily better, better off uh, than the present or the past, it is not surprising then that they are left to fend for themselves, despite the fact that many uh, decisions in the present, such as national debt uh, and environmental degradation, pose significant uh, constraints upon the future. So the democratic bias uh, for uh, toward the current generation might be thought simply by appealing to some intertemporal majority principle. But since future generations inevitably outnumber the present generation uh, over the course of, of the democratic process taken as a whole, the bias would simply shift to the future, imposing undue uh, burdens on the present. In order to overcome all of these difficulties, Thompson proposes that citizens see themselves as part of a temporal series of sovereigns in which the form of future democracy is left open. Nonetheless, given the ways that the present generation can still affect future democratic sovereigns, each generation institutionally represents uh, future sovereigns in their own institutions by acting as trustees for the democratic process. Each generation is thus entrusted to hand democracy to the future sovereign people without uh, uh, dominating them and thus allowing them to exercise competent control. The notion that the present generation is a trustee uh, uh, for the past, uh, holding uh, future sovereignty and trust, is an appropriate development of Burke's idea of the intergenerational polity. This is not uh, captured fully by simply representational devices, uh, such as third party uh, representation. Um, uh, Thompson talks about a tribunate uh, on the Roman model for the ways in which uh, the Roman uh, citizens protected uh, the plebes. Um, uh, but it, uh, the tribunate, uh, um, uh, I think, is uh, insufficient uh, on its own without a way of dividing power 
uh, among the current generation uh, uh, and uh, the past and the future. More generally then, each generation as a whole does act as a future, uh, uh, as a trustee of democracy for the future generations in their deliberation. Uh, the future thus is part of the audience uh, that uh, such deliberators uh, consider uh, in providing justifications uh, for uh, their policies. All, there are various possible devices from commissions uh, to, other, uh, to other kinds of institutional devices. Um, I would tend to favor uh, in cases uh, where it's uh, obvious that forms of intergenerational domination are at stake uh, to use deliberative bodies uh, such as many publics uh, uh, to reflect upon uh, the, whether or not the practices of trusteeship at any given time uh, are uh, adequate. Thus, Thompson's approach, I think, recognizes metaf the metaphysical difficulties of representing the future uh, and accepts uh, the necessity of trusteeship as the only feasible uh, proposal. While the limits he discusses hold for representatives who cannot simply know the interests of those uh, who, who they represent, the proper uh, solution, I think, is, uh, first of all, to recognize that the future has very general claims, uh, uh, basically human rights claims uh, upon uh, the present, and that the future must be able to have statuses um, uh, that uh, current democracy uh, also has uh, in its institution, its institutions, um, as already has been done with, with respect uh, to uh, the claims of the past, uh, as I've talked about in the Canadian examples. It should be similarly possible to make claims for manifest future injustice, injustices um, as were made to the Canadian Supreme Court, such as violations of environmental security or well-being freedom uh, in sense sense. Public power to make claims on behalf of the past and the future is not, I think, anything mysterious. While our political community has a stronger sense of the reality of the future than the past, the Maori and others are genuinely intergenerational political communities um, in which power is consid considered to be normatively shared across time. The presentist bias of current democracy is thus social rather than a metaphysical fact. And many democracies are now seeking to rectify past wrongs. But the recognition of claims to justice is not the only way in which uh, sovereignty ought to be shared. There are instrumental benefits of democracy that cannot be achieved without recognizing the intertemporal character uh, of, um, of sovereignty. Um, and then uh, the next section, I'll talk a bit about um, uh, um, environmental um, security uh, as an inst instrumental benefit um, of uh, intergenerational uh, democracy. And that's based on, I think, an analogy uh, between um, ecological insecurity on the one hand and the insecurity um, of constitutional democracy uh, to uh, political violence. Um, the 18th century Republicans, uh, such as Kant and Diderot, uh, undertook a criticism of the imperial tendencies of states um, that had enormous imp implications to undermining uh, the uh, emergent uh, republics. It suggested that citizens um, are to have the means to, present, to prevent the great evils of war and colonial ex expansion, and that they should, in order to have them, demand an international system of institutions that would afford such protections and limit the imperial ambitions of their own states. If we take such modern Republican arguments seriously, we could modify them uh, in, uh, uh, in their attempt uh, to rethink the proper location uh, of citizenship uh, and its exercise. One possibility, of course, is that some supranational institutions would exist to make sure that democratic states are more uh, 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 
uh, rather than less democratic by maintaining a common space uh, for uh, liberty. This sort of institutional structure was needed to overcome the negative feedback relationship between empires uh, that undermine the liberty uh, at home. Thus, the cosmopolitan commitment of Republicans led them uh, to argue uh, for uh, an institutional context in which laws could, uh, were not framed for a single uh, society, uh, but rather with the interests uh, of uh, neighbors and common humanity uh, uh, as such. So instead of democracies making in international relations among states more peaceable, the new constellation um, of uh, potential political violence, I think, um, demands uh, that states become less, uh, 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 states become more democratic, uh, not only by opening their inter opening themselves to internal standards uh, of um, human rights, uh, but also to a whole uh, uh, array of threats to security that have to do with temporal forms uh, of uh, domination, uh, and the most obvious of which is environmental insecurity. Here we might, uh, we might think not just of pollution and global warming, but the availability of safe drinking water, uh, epi epidemiological security, uh, and many causes of premature mor morbidity. Even if this insecurity um, does not affect the agent agency of all citizens, everyone, everyone's well-being freedom will decrease with the loss of environmental public goods. Indeed, the common economic assumption that future genera generations will inevitably be better off than the present um, itself uh, depends on environmental security, which is precisely what cannot be assumed in irreversible processes uh, such as global warming. So in these cases, environmental security applies across political communities and has thus worsened because of the lack of effective uh, collective action uh, by democracies. Issues of environmental security are thus truly global problems that cannot be easily solved by the current state system that seeks to protect the sovereignty of its, of its members. It is not clear that the exercise of a global sovereign uh, would be uh, any more uh, effective. So as in the case of war and, and famine, it is easy to see the um, effects of the absence of a certain kind of security um, uh, that uh, should be the product of democracy. Uh, and uh, 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 here we might think of uh, an alternative explanation to the economic ones usually offered as the failure of current institutions to supply needed security of the rights and entitlements of poor citizens to commonly held natural resources, such as water and grazing lands uh, that they've held for generations. The entitlements here are not rights to ownership, but rights to access and to management of environmental resources. And in the absence of which, there is no assurance that more powerful actors will not expropriate the commons and deny existing rights uh, for their use by local communities. With the degradation of the lo local resource base, uh, local people then lack well-being freedom that has been enabled to them, uh, enabled them to sustainably use uh, these uh, resources across generations. So insecurity in the well-being freedom of local groups is thus directly related to the domination of the future, a form of domination that cannot be justified in, simply in terms of, long, of the long-term um, shift from commons to external authority and to in resource intensive technologies of resource management. Such substitutions prove uh, not only costly, uh, but can also lead uh, to uh, financial uh, uh, disaster. And these institutional shifts, I think, no longer provide environmental security uh, even to the best off. They are also uh, permit the domination of the past by denying the inheritance of property rights based on sharing resources, rights of use, as opposed to practices based on um, uh, private ownership. Attempts to control the Mississippi watershed industrially, for example, have led to less rather than more uh, environmental uh, insecurity. So I think we can, um, 
argue that uh, environmental security is a global public good, but also a uh, public good uh, that uh, requires uh, uh, justice uh, across uh, generations, uh, uh, where uh, shared freedom uh, is uh, the public good uh, which uh, environmental uh, security uh, helps uh, to bring about. And thus, in order to overcome insecure democracy, um, uh, a democracy across uh, generations uh, and uh, a democracy uh, across uh, space uh, will also uh, be necessary. Um, I think the, this, the structure, I think, um, for this would be uh, is more transnational than global, but I don't have time to make that uh, argument uh, right now. I think there's a division of labor uh, in the trustee role um, uh, of uh, current democracies, and this division of labor, to some extent, uh, it, uh, requires a variety of different institutions and uh, locations for, uh, for its exercise, uh, and uh, these, some of these institutions, I think, would be uh, transnational, uh, so that transnational institutions are uh, among the best ways uh, to secure uh, environmental uh, uh, justice, and thus justice across generations. So these arguments concerning interge intergenerational public goods of security do not exhaust possible justifications for intergenerational and transnational democracy. It could also be thought um, to be instrumentally valuable to the extent uh, that um, both of these uh, will be uh, able, will enable us at least to avoid the worst effects uh, of certain kinds of environmental uh, degradation. Some of the worst evils to be addressed by new forms of political and environmental security uh, um, include uh, effects uh, of uh, climate change, uh, which I think is a result, uh, also a result of domination. In the case of such forms of domination, uh, intergeneral, intergenerational democracy um, uh, is uh, necessary. The metaphysical arguments that I mentioned before can give, be given a positive and practical twist. Even, if a fully, even in a fully intergenerational democracy, the generations cannot obviously be mutually and simultaneously together in an act of self-constitution. But given that in, the, in um, uh, these cases, uh, there are valuable intersecting and overlapping forms of international and uh, uh, other political order for promoting dom uh, non-domination, a democracy of demoi, a plural democracy, um, makes sense both spatially and temporally. When a democracy declares itself to be the final sovereign, it cannot, as a dominator, realize unavoidably shared goods, such as freedom and security. So this first step in my argument for intergenerational democracy is to abandon the assumption that democracies cannot be dominators. In the temporal sense, this domination begins at home in this generation that has produced increasingly insecure and unsustainable democracy. A secure and sustainable democracy is, on my account, a matter of achieving intergenerational justice. Uh, a stimulating talk. Uh, I, I think I am on board with uh, pretty much.
much everything you have to say about uh, intergenerational democracy, but uh, you have some worries about how you are theorizing temporality. Uh, let me voice uh, one worry concerning the present, and then another worry concerning uh, the analogy between the past and the future. Now, concerning the present, I really don't see a necessary connection between presentism or the focus on the present and what you were calling the tyranny of the present and the domination of the, of the past and the future. Because, for example, in the philosophy of the present, George Herbert Mead uh, shows that there, there is or there can be a form of presentism uh, that is actually not uh, narcissistic uh, and it is not oblivious to the ethical obligations that we have with respect to the past or with respect to the future. It's a kind of presentism in which the attentiveness to the present moment involves the attentiveness to the kind of historical <coughs> beings we are and the temporal orientations we have and how we are uh, uh, necessarily uh, uh, shaped by previous generations and necessarily oriented towards future generations. So for example, even the Canadian case that you examined could be uh, actually very, very well explained and motivated and politically justified uh, with this uh, medium presentism. Or I was thinking uh, actually something I'm more familiar with, the case of uh, Spain in the last five years and the revisiting of the Civil War and the Franco years and so on and so forth. I mean, this entire political debate and the new legislation that was generated and so on was for the most part motivated and justified uh, from the point of view of the present because of the kind of community we are, because of the kind of ethical beings we are today, we have uh, to go back to the past. And we have to do so with an eye to the present, with an eye to the future. Now, by the same token, in the same way that I don't see a necessary connection between presentism and the, the tyranny of the present, I don't see a necessary connection between uh, uh, shifting the focus to the, to the past and the future and avoiding the tyranny of the present. Because there are many cases, many historical examples of ideological instrumentalization of the past and the future, so that even though society uh, as a whole is, is, is pushed to look mainly at the future and sacrifice themselves for the sake of possible wars and so on and so forth, it is an ideological instru instrumentalization of the future that is actually serving a tyranny of the present it is contributing to the domination of the future, and it is also dominating the present in an interesting way. And of course, there are many, even more examples about doing the same thing with the past for the sake of tradition and so on. So that's my first worry. Right. Now my second worry, which is shorter, my second worry, which is my shorter, is that I, I understand what you're doing with the analogy between the past and the present uh, in saying that, that both of them are impinging upon us, uh, and we have to look at this ethical demands. but I think there are very important disanalogies between the past, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, between the past and the future as well, between the past and the future that may have important social and political implications. For example, I agree with you that the past is not closed. However, I do not think that the past is open in exactly the same way that the future is open for us. I think Mead actually was wrong when he said the past is open in the same way the future because the interpretation of the past is open, uh, but actually some things have happened, and we cannot undo them. We have to respond to them, or we cannot undo them. But then also, I think the future is different from the past in the sense that in the past, we have had voices that have been lost, are not there anymore, subjects who have existed, that they made claims, and so on. In the future, we do not have that yet. And then I'm very worried about speaking on behalf of these potential subjects who do not exist and claiming that it is the same as paying attention to the claims and the voices uh, that actually happened uh, and made their uh, because in one case, in the case of the past, people had a voice that you have to respect and so on. In the case of the future, you are making up a voice. I don't think these subjects are interpolated or should be interpolated in the same way. Um. No, I don't think so either. Uh, but uh, I guess the, the first question is, I, th I think there is a, if you, 
if you use uh, Mead's notion of presentism, then I think um, then most of what I said is consistent with it. Uh, but um, because what Mead has this sense of all past, present, and, and future being completely intertwined. Um, so, but I, I think there's a, uh, a real sense of a bias towards the present in current democratic practices, both in their myopic, in the sense that they don't see very far into the future, uh, and also in, in some, except in cases of transformation, they're also myopic with respect to the past. So I think um, I, I agree most with most everything that Mead says about the past. Um, and uh, so uh, in that sense, I actually have written a paper on uh, obligations to the past, which is primarily uh, using that uh, conception. Um, I think it, it's true that um, when Mead says things like um, the past is like a train schedule subject to change at any moment, um, that yeah, those are uh, that's an exaggerated uh, conception of the openness of the past. Um, I do think, however, the past. Um, uh, I, I guess I'm. I, we disagree to some extent. I'm not sure how uh, how to um, quite identify uh, the disagreement, but I think um, there. I think while the uh, the. What you identify about the past is crucial. Uh, in this sense, I think the past has made claims. The future, of course, uh, in its non-existence, is a non-existence which uh, doesn't permit any claims to be inherited at all. So there, there is a disanalogy, which I, I meant to bring out. I'm not sure if it came out. In the, I may have skipped that part. But there, there is a disanalogy in that respect. So when you're, there are strong constraints about how you can speak about the future. And um, the, um, that we have obligations to the future at all with, res that with respect to environmental security is, I think, still an important point uh, to make. But um, I think what you can say about the future is um, uh, very, are very general kinds of claims. And, and also, we have very general kinds of obligations towards them. So we. With respect to the future, we have an obligation of trusteeship with regard to, to uh, democracy. That the form of the that we have to um, uh, uh, we are the trustee for the a form of democracy that would be robust enough uh, to uh, make it possible for future generations to act uh, as a temporary sovereign. So, but I uh, in the with regard to the past, the the institutional connections made by the court um, uh, specify the ways that the, the voices of the past are going to be taken up uh, and change the, uh, the polity. So it required, um, in, as in most of these cases, it requires a sort of pivotal uh, reinterpretation of the political obligations of the present, which formally the views in Canada were very similar to the United States. The, any property uh, that was uh, ill-begotten by colonialism could be compensated for monetarily. Um, and uh, the court decision, I think, changes that um, uh, solution to the, to, the, to the particular kind of problem. But that also required um, opening up the polity uh, in particular kinds of ways to forms of evidence and kinds of claims that had never been actually countenanced before, at least not juridically uh, countenanced. So I think the, um, the voices, uh, the claims of the, pre uh, of the past to injustice are, um, uh, are there, but it, 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 the, uh, the, in a certain sense, I think Mead is right <laughs> that in being taken up um, in the present, there's a novel past. The novel past of Canada includes um, the injustices that it, uh, that it did uh, in ways that the US has never recognized. So I, I think that's a novel past. Um, and I, that kind of, a, of the way in which 
But I, I'm very taken with that example because it shows that the perspective of the past can be present institutionally and transform the conception of political communities. And uh, however, it, what the past has stronger effects because of its, the specificity of its claim. But in the future, we can, in general, make, uh, we do have to, there's no one to, to articulate the claims of the future uh, except us in the present. And we can only make very general claims, both in terms of democracy or human rights. Those are the types of claims. I'm thinking about history. And I think uh, there's a problem that we, we philosophers all have uh, of engaging in abstractions that uh, we intentionally make very broad. We want to speak universally. We want to be philosophers and not really describers of facts. Uh, but sometimes our abstractions are so dominated by specific examples. Uh, so when we say future generations, we mean the environment in general, global warming in specific. When we say the past, we mean remediation for past inter intercommunal depredations. And uh, don't think more broadly. Um, so I want to think about some of the moral connections that can exist between the present and its past and its future. Um, I think about Stalinism and Maoism and how demands were made upon people in the present uh, in behalf of gains to be secured by future generations. Uh, demands which often included um, genocide and, and uh, you know, 20 million people here, uh, Mao Zedong announced that he would be perfectly ready to see a third or a half of the Chinese populace wiped out in behalf of a glorious future that um, he vaguely described and perhaps even more vaguely envisioned. Uh, people in the 18th century who took a very presentist kind of view uh, were very worried about more pain. Uh, Kant, for example, in his legal and social political writings, worries about the, the control that a will written in the past might exercise over the freedom of individuals in the future. Uh, so I worry about um, domination of running in the wrong direction or in the wrong uh, dimension. Uh, you proposed certain remedies to domination greater cosmopolitan, transnational institutions, commissions, and so forth. Uh, we have to remember, I think, that when people introduced national sovereignty, there was a broad popular demand. People more Tory than Burke, like you, uh, stood up for king and country uh, because they thought that was a solution to a problem of too much localism too much uh, uh, controlled by the past. Uh, so they, uh, they would have been alarmed uh, at these commissions and these transnational institutions. The transnational institutions for them would have smacked of the papacy uh, with some kind of groupthink as the new dogma. Uh, and the commissions would have smacked of feudalism with some kind of a dilution of the state power whose sovereignty was meant to protect those rights of the individual. Let me just propose an alternative line of solution, which has to do, uh, in a very Burkean spirit, with envisioning what's really most basic and what's really most central about our values and our connection with both the past and the future. That is, that we envision ourselves as part of a human community, which is indeed transgenerational. Uh, and our, our values, our ethics, our constitutions should embed and embody those values and strive to make the appeal of what we take most permanent, most inviting, and most inducing of, of, of allegiance by those who come after us. Uh, 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 I, think, I think there's a job here more for poets than for commissionaires to, to voice 
values that can speak to people <coughs> transgenerationally so that they can look back at us and say, yeah, this is what we, they bequeathed us, it's worth preserving. Uh, setting up institutions uh, of, of the kind that you described, I worry could be just an excuse for another kind of domination, which we might not see as domination, but later generations would. Um, I do think that the that um, historically the domination of the past has, has been, uh, was really the issue of the Enlightenment uh, so in the, the 18th century. So, uh, however, um, uh, so I also, uh, uh, I think that the past can dominate the present. I think the future can dominate the present. So, in fact, I think I, said, I think I said that we don't want a majoritarian principle because it would mean the domination of the future. Um, uh, a simple global majoritarian principle means the domination of the but future. But you acknowledge also uh, that democracies can do the same thing. Sure. The, but uh, I think what, um, so the best view is something like what you suggested. It's a view of all of the, uh, it has to be an intergenerational view. So in that sense, I want to be, be Burkean. So what, what I think the biggest problem of the present is exactly what he said, which is that the, the current so democratic sovereign claims to be final and, and ultimate authority. So it claims final authority or all, to be ultimate mad master of the historical process. So I think that, so some of that is a diagnos diagnosis of the, of, the, of the current problem. So I, I agree the examples that you gave about um, the Stalinism or Maoism uh, would be a kind of domination of the future over the, pre over the present. And uh, uh, I think some of that um, um, is present in the human rights documents of the, uh, uh, the Universal Declaration uh, and also the institutions that emerged out of it is actually the, is, is, is a strong attempt to check state power that, that uh, promoted the domination of the future. Um, so, so I, and also the, the, there are lots of, besides the Thomas Jefferson and others are also saw the domination of the past, even in constitutionalism as, as a problem. So um, I, wanna, I wanna take a, a view which is democratic, at least in the sense that it, I, want, I wanna say it's, it is a partnership among the, uh, the dead, the living, and, and those who are not yet born. So I want uh, so I, I want to preserve uh, I want to take it to be literally intergenerational. I think environmental security is the problem of the domination of the present over the future. Um, just like average, the problem of, of colonialism turned into the domination of the past. But colonialism was a very popular movement when it was underway. Didn't uh, environmentalism, didn't internationalism, didn't uh, Um, well, since, since, they don't, since they don't have strong institutional powers yet, but they are, sure, they would be equally capable of, but that's why I said that it, what I'm interested in is not a global demos, but uh, it has to be an organization of demoi. It would be more pluralistic than, than certain other uh, conceptions, but I, don't, I think that on uh, the index to the current, the problem of, current institutionalization and the, and the failure of democracies to really institutionalize a relationship to the future, I think most of what, um, when the past was dominating, dominating the Enlightenment came up with a whole set of new institutions. When, when, it, when states co caused insecurity from political violence, diplomacy up until uh, the UN uh, created a whole set of institutions. So I think some of the institutions that I'm talking about, I actually am not so enthusiastic about commissions, but there are way, they're just, I think they're more devices uh, than anything else, but it, what, uh, what they do is at least introduce the perspective of the future. So I can't say that, it, and there is an inevitability of a certain trusteeship of the future for reasons that Jose mentioned, but that the future uh, hasn't, can't directly make claims, even though we have obligations uh, that could be formed as claims. Um, but I, so I, yes, I, I, but I, so in that sense, I would think that given the problem of, 
of environmental and security, the, uh, I think new institutions are called for. But at, all institutions have potential for domination. That's, that's why shared liberty, the, the sort of Republican uh, solutions of the uh, separation of power, division of labor, which I talked about, just mentioned at the end, in division of institutional labor uh, would uh, at least be an some, somewhat antidote to that. But that, so I agree that those are serious problems and that the best view is more fully Burkean. Uh, although I, Burke is uh, uh, a bit too conservative and a bit too contractarian for me. Uh, but, uh, uh, but in the sense that he, uh, he sees, I don't think he saw the, the future as based on a fixed past. And that, that seems to be, uh, they expected the past to interpret, or the future to interpret the past. That, that seems to be the, it seems to be a rich enough conception if it's fully intergenerational. Um, when you were answering Jose, uh, you said something like, we, we, uh, we have an obligation to be the future. And I guess, um, I guess when, I, when I, was, I was thinking about how you were saying we're, we're biased to the present, and it seems to me that the problem is not so much that we're biased to uh, things, we're biased to looking at problems that are happening now, but it seems like that we have this bias where we think there is actually just one present. Um, and it seems to me that there are actually many presents and there are many futures that are going to be um, happening. And it seems like that the value of whether, whether or not we're actually biased towards the present, it seems to me that, 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 that um, if we're going to judge the value of that bias, it seems to me that we have to talk about sort of the particular present that we are biased towards and the particular futures that might emerge out of that. So I guess I worry that um, if we're going to build democratic institutions that represent in some ways the future, I guess I wonder whether you're sort of reinscribing um, a kind of monolithic view of the future, which in turn would actually, in a weird way, um, reinscribe this problem of presentism that we're actually back to. I guess that that I. Think of the future as a kind of shorthand, but um, but you're right; it, it can be sort of reifying to say just say the future, or the past, uh, or the present. So, but um, uh, in order to to try to express that these are all three interrelated, you, um, it would be give rise to very long constructions to make them fully plural. But I, I accept that criti criti criticism. But I think. There's one sense in which there is a, uh, there is a future, and it's looming, and, and uh, it has to do with what happens when global warming exceeds five degrees centigrade. Uh, that's going to be shared by all people. And that, I think, um, there, is a, there is a certain way in which there, uh, as an unavoidable, uh, it seems to be, without, uh, without some political intervention, that seems to be the future. <laughs> Uh, so that uh, some of what I'm interested in um, is the way in which um, the, that's why I talked about economic practices. So the, pre the prevalence of particular kinds of economic practice, substitution of resources, resource intensive industrial ways of securing certain kind of environmental goods. Um, so, but, uh, so in that sense, I think there is a kind of global future, and it, but it's not, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, something that, that needs to be avoided. <laughs> so, and that. Yeah, yeah. No, although you need, in order to avoid problems of intergener intergenerational domination of any kind, the past of the present, uh, the future of the present, the present of the future and the past, uh, we need, a, we need a, con a different conception of sovereignty, which is not the people now assembled, 
And so I think, um, I, actually, I do think it would make a big difference if people regarded themselves as sharing sovereignty uh, across generations. So, I, so I, I think it's a, I don't think it's the only, it's not the, it's not the only aspect of democratic theory, but I think it's an under, <coughs> underdeveloped aspect of democratic theory. So I actually have broader views than that. <laughs> uh, but I think it, um, I think it has to be, there's a lack of temporality in democratic theory. And it, and I have done it myself. Um, so, but I, and I'm repenting but, uh, publicly. But, uh, the, but I, so I, I think you're right. But I, I think there is an issue of that has to do with the temporality of sovereignty. Um, I really appreciate the emphasis you're placing on time and temporality. And I think the question that I would like to ask two questions are arise out of the shared concern. The first is your use of the word trans transnational, and the use of that word in connection with what I take, but I'm not sure, is a search on your part for a structural solution. It seems to me that the word trans imprints, no matter what we say to the contrary, an emphasis on presence. And it suggests, by the word trans, a continuation, your word was intergenerational, but a connection, a mechanism, by which a certain continuing presence moves us to the future with a certain kind of consistency. I appreciate the desire uh, for a kind of way to address problems that presence, our emphasis on the presence creates. I worry that your use of the word trans actually furthers the very conception that you want to avoid or you want to critique. The second is, I guess I put the pressure this way, it plays off with some of the issues that I think Lynn raised earlier. Do you really think that we should look for solutions to the environmental crisis? Solutions. I'm asking you how serious you take the limits present perspective? Um, I think the notion of solutions um, to environmental problems ha is uh, part of the problem. So I agree with that. So that, um, and um, there is a whole, I think there are a whole lot of blind spots, say, in, in economic analyses of of various environmental problems, uh, which ignores the ways in which um, the environment contributes uh, uh, to human well-being uh, in a fairly direct way. So in that sense, I don't think, I think some of the solution would be to stop what we're doing right now. And uh, so I, I that in the sense that a solution that, that a solution is required in the, in the sense that um, um, the Continuation of certain practices into the future will result in great human suffering, and uh, I think that should be avoided. Um, so, what needs to be? Um, it also will. It also will make certain other goods unsustainable as well. So, uh, I guess I, I. So, in that sense, I think there has to be a solution. Some that has to be avoided, and what it, whatever I call the solution, what would be whatever makes that possible. Uh, not what, what, well, what, it, yeah, what, something that itself would not cause greater, uh, would not, would not cause great human suffering. But, but um, so I, I think in a, I think some, I think there is, there are things that uh, can be done. Mostly they have to do with reorganizing the way we, um, our practices and our activities. And that's what I think I'm contributing to. Um, but I don't think that uh, capturing carbon and putting it under the ground and all these other things are, are the solution so, to global warming. I, I think some of it, it is deeply institutional. Um, I'm not sure. I, I guess 
the, I use trans in, as an alternative um, to, um, there, there, are do, there are a number of cosmopolitan terms. One is international, and uh, which, uh, actually I want to say it, it actually sounds sort of better, but <laughs> international and transnational, and, and international is, the, is identified typically with the system of states. Uh, and the institutions that were created by the system of states that, like the UN presupposes, something like non-intervention uh, and uh, the sovereignty of states uh, in, um, uh, in the state system. So my use of it has to do with, the, with debates among cosmopolitans. And transnational institutions are, um, uh, as opposed to global or international institutions. So transnational institutions does not require uh, a global hierarchy of institutions, but, an, but an or, nonetheless a type of organization, um, a, a set of institutions uh, that uh, avoid the problems of the other views. So I'm, I'm thinking about it in, more in terms of those debates. I don't know if it, I don't, I, um, the reason why you say transnational or transgenerational is because um, it seems to me it preserves the, the fact that there is a plurality of generations. That's what I, and I don't know if the word speaks of it by itself, but what I hope it, what I hope it communicates is this kind of plurality of generations. Um, I think it does better than other words, but I may be wrong about that. So what I want is a word that preserves plurality, but uh, discusses ways in which uh, institutions can help promote that very plurality. Yeah, I apologize, I didn't hear your talk. Um, <laughs> but from, what, from the answer to your questions, I wish I had. Um, and I've come up with one of my own. And if you've covered it, I apologize. I'm wondering whether there are My question is, on that sort of analogy, couldn't um, future people be given standing uh, legally such that, uh, obviously, there could be arguments about who had a right to represent them, but uh, um, I mean, that happens in, in the law already with, with the Sierra Club and, you know, Straightforward legal concepts which give uh, interest to deceased persons that, that and then they name executors. Um, and um, so I think, and also even in, in the same context of, of wills, there are, um, I think it's called the, 
the uh, heirs and issues, that's the future heirs, the, 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 uh, of the a person. So the issue, the issue of the person. Um, so I think there are legal fictions which capture this. Uh, some of the ideas uh, of, um, some people propose something like that, uh, and I, I mentioned Dennis Thompson in the talk. He proposes um, that there be a, like a, an office for a, a future affairs, a tribunate. A tri uh, and uh, some people propose that that would have be quasi-juridical in the, in the same sense that um, it would be like the ICC is to crimes against humanity. Um, I, I think that would be the outcome of some process of change and not, it would be, it would be difficult to imagine it being instituted <laughs> that people would actually give um, legally binding power to some court to act to limit the present in terms of the future, but uh, by itself. So, uh, but it, I, think it, it, I think the law does, so I don't have a good answer to that. I, I, the, law would, the law could be used to, re it is used to regulate relationships between generations and so formalize and regulate them. And I think, um, so I think that's right. Uh, I haven't got a, a clear idea how uh, that would work in terms of whether, um, how the future would be represented um, or what theory, legal theory could be proposed to give um, the future uh, uh, or the, the, those who make the claims on behalf of the future uh, the capacity to sue others. But I think, but I think that's right. I think some of the reason why it's not conceptually and metaphysically preposterous to talk about um, the claims of the future and the past is precisely because of how pervasive they are in, in law. That, I think Dennis Thompson means that when he said, instead of, by using the Roman term tribunate he's, and for the plebes, <laughs> he's, mer he's merely suggesting uh, a possibility that could be filled out in different ways. Um, but, I, but you're right, I think the law is a rich source of discussions of, of temporal relations among persons. 